everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, a Genie Vlogger, and welcome back to another Professional Genealogist Reacts. On today's video, I will be reacting to Cousins Explained by the channel Ding, which is basically like a Vsauce channel, I think. I don't remember ever hearing of it before, but it obviously has Michael from Vsauce hosting, and looking at it, it's got a lot of the different Vsauce people. But this video basically just explains Cousins, so I figured it'd be kind of a fun one to watch, especially something a little bit different than DNA testing. And it'll be interesting to see how he discusses some of the different issues when it comes to names of relationships of cousins and such. And maybe I'll be able to touch on certain things that he's not able to touch on. So let's jump into the video. What is a cousin? Now my mom is not my cousin, but she does have cousins. And her cousins are my first cousins once removed. What I wonder if he's going to go into the concept of zeroth cousins, uh, which is always kind of a funny concept that some people do to kind of think of like, okay, well, there's first cousins, but then there's zeroth cousins. And then there's, <laughs> yeah, we'll continue. What does that mean to be removed? And what does it mean to be a first cousin or a second cousin? We'll begin with you. That's yourself. In my case, it is me. Now, I didn't just appear out of nowhere. I was born through the union of two humans, which I call my parents. I'm gonna put my parents up here diagonally above me, and we are directly related, meaning I literally dipped into their DNA to make myself. The DNA of my parents, half for my mom, half for my dad made me, so I share 50% of my DNA with each of my parents. But I someday may have children. And those people will be called, well, they'll be called my children. I'm gonna put them down here. You'll notice that a row on this chart represents a different generation. If my children have children, those people will be my grandchildren, but then their children will be my great grandchildren. And this continues, well, for as long as reproduction continues to happen. But my parents also had parents. I call those people my grandparents. Their parents are my great grandparents. So this means that technically there is no such thing as great parents. No matter how nice yours are, no matter how accepting or inspirational or understanding or unconditionally full of love they are, they are not great parents. No one will ever be a great parent. They will only ever be a grand parent. Then the greats get added on. <clears throat> or they could be a zero with great grandparent. Now parents <laughs> can have children that are not you. Well, Those actually, are... I guess I guess that that doesn't that's not right because he said you couldn't be a great parent. I just said zero with great grandparent. All right, let's continue. Called your siblings, they are on the same row as your row because you're in the same generation. I wonder if he's going to go into half siblings and things like that too. Your siblings descend directly from your parents, just as did you. But your siblings can have kids. And those kids are your nieces and nephews. CGP Gray has a great name for these. Uh, rather than calling them nieces and nephews, let's just call them nibblings. The children of your siblings, nibblings. Their kids follow this exact same pattern. Their kids will be called your grand nibblings. Their kids will be your great grand nibblings, and so on. Now your grandparents may have had kids that weren't your parents. Their children, that aren't your parents are called your aunts and uncles. Your great grandparents, children that are not your grandparents are called your grand aunts and uncles and so on. This will be an interesting part to see. Does he get into the controversy of grand aunts and uncles and then great grands aunts and uncles versus great aunts and uncles and then second great aunts and uncles? There's a big uh, debate about what's the proper way to do it. And I have heard arguments from professional genealogists for both camps of using grand aunts and uncles and then great grand aunts and uncles and then second great grand, third great grand, etc. versus great aunt uncle, second great aunt uncle, third great aunt uncle. So a second great aunt uncle 
would be a great grand aunt uncle. So it's like this big debate saying great grand aunt uncle so many times just makes it sound like I'm saying a bunch of nonsense words. Let's continue. <laughs> Everything else we put on this graph will be some kind of cousin. And every kind of cousin has a degree and an amount of removal. In order to figure out the degree and the removal amount, we need to locate a most recent common ancestor. An ancestor isn't just anyone on this tree. It is someone that you directly descended from. So for example- Now this is interesting because this is something I find a lot of people in the polls I put out will have different definitions of things. So I'll do a lot of polls on my channel that'll be, you know, how many ancestors do you have that did this? Or I remember one I did was, you know, a hundred years ago in the year 1923, how many ancestors did you have that were alive? And a lot of people wouldn't give ancestors. They'd give, oh, well, I had a ton of relatives alive. I, you know, my great grandparents were alive and my aunts and my uncle and this and that. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. Ancestors, not relatives, ancestors. But there are a lot of people that kind of conflate the words and they'll say, you know, they'll say ancestors when they really mean relatives or cousins when they really mean relatives or just kind of a variation of thing. And then in different cultures, sometimes that can be similar. In the Netherlands, when they say cousin or niece or nephew, it's kind of the same thing. So when you say neef, that's nephew and it's cousin. When you say nicht, it's niece and it's cousin. So you can use the terms interchangeably, which actually makes it really annoying when you're doing genealogy because like I have records from the 1700s in Amsterdam where it says the witness to this marriage was the niece Sarah Ribeiro. And it's like, well, was she the actual niece? Like the sister, you know, the sibling's daughter? Or was she a cousin as in the parent's sibling's child? Or even it could be a different type of cousin because they might have just said cousin in the general sense, but really she was a second cousin or a first cousin once removed or something else that he has yet to get into. So let's continue. Well, my parents took DNA from their parents, my grandparents. So some of my grandparents' DNA was inside them and then I grabbed from that. So I got some of this DNA. But my aunt I like how he purposely does not say, you know, they're 50 and 50 of their parents. So then it breaks down 50% to me. So I must have 25% because that isn't the way it works. You will get about 25%, but because of what's known as recombination, then when you get your DNA from your parents, yes, you're getting 50% of your autosomal DNA from your mom, 50% of your autosomal DNA from your dad, but then it's not going to be a perfect 25%, 25% breakdown from their parents, your grandparents, it's going to be different. So sometimes you might get a lot from one grandparent and not as much from the other. So like, I think when I did my DNA, I found out that on my maternal side, I had my grandmother test and I was matching up to about 21, 22% of her DNA, which presumably then means that 28% of my DNA or whatever that is, uh, what 56% of the DNA I inherited from my mom is coming from my grandfather. And then what's really interesting about the concept of recombination is what happens is as you go back in time, eventually you're gonna reach a point where you have certain ancestors where they are your ancestors, but there's none of their DNA that you're inheriting. And I think this, you usually start to see this once you start to get back to like fourth great grandparents or so, that's when you start to get into the range of like, you might not actually be inheriting DNA from them, but especially once you get back to fifth, sixth, seventh great grandparents, it's very possible that you're getting nothing from a lot of them. But also remember, you know, you have four grandparents, eight great grandparents, 16 second great grandparents, 32, 64, 128, you know, it keeps doubling. So it makes sense that, you know, it's eventually going to get to that point. But let's continue. Aunts and uncles are not my genetic ancestors because I did not take any DNA from their pool. They took some from their parents, which are my grandparents, and I also got to touch some of theirs because it went through my parents. So me and my aunts and uncles share a most recent common ancestor that is my grandparents. Now notice that if we pair you with anyone else currently on this diagram, there will be at least one trip to your most recent common ancestor with that other person that is direct, that passes through no generations. And that is what makes you not a cousin. 
If the shortest of the two journeys two people must take to reach their most recent common ancestor does pass through at least one generation, well then, you are some kind of cousin. For instance, let's take a look at my aunts and uncles. I mean, completely true. I've never actually kind of thought about it in that sort of a way, but that is exactly how it is. Now, if they have children, the children would go right here. Our most recent common ancestor will be right here. The people that I call my grandparents, and actually, so do they. But in order to get from me to my grandparents, I have to pass through one generation, my parents. And for these people to get to my grandparents, they too must pass through one generation. The smaller amount of generations passed through is the degree of cousinality. In this case, we both pass through one, and the ordinal number for one is first. So, the children of my aunts and uncles are my first cousins. Now, because we both have journeys of the same length, passing through one generation, there's no removal. But the children of my first cousins, which will exist right down here, that's a whole different story. Me and my first cousin's children have a most recent common ancestor that is my grandparents, their great-grandparents. So if we look at these journeys, we have to go through one, two generations for them to get to the most recent common ancestor. But for me, I only have to go through one. The degree is named after the smaller of the two, so these are still my first cousins. But if both of the journeys are of different lengths, then the difference between those lengths is the removal. These people must go through two generations to get to the most recent common, and I only go through one. Two minus one is one. So my first cousin's children are my first cousins once removed their children will still be my first cousins. Their degree is still one, because although their journey takes them through one, two, three generations, my journey to the most recent common ancestor just takes me through one. One is smaller than three, so they're first cousins. But the difference between our journey lengths is the removal number. They go through three, I go through one, three minus one is two. They are my first cousins twice removed. Now, an interesting concept with the removal system, I guess you could say, is that there are some genealogists, kind of more of a fringe group. Well, I guess fringe is maybe a weird word to use for it, but there's a, a group of genealogists that say that we should use something a bit more complicated than removed. And the reason for that is because a first cousin once removed, they are your first cousin's child. That's your first cousin once removed, but that's not the only first cousins once removed. The other first cousins once removed are your parents' first cousins. So in the same sense that for you to get to your first cousin once removed, that's the child of your first cousin, you're going to your first cousin and then going down one generation. Whereas the other way, let's say you're this one, you're going up one generation. So there, are, it's kind of the same thing as, you know, when you say your nibblings or nieces or nephews, well, they're going to call you aunt or uncle. So it's kind of the same thing, whereas aunt or uncle is technically the niece or nephew up and niece or nephew nibblings would be niece or nephew down. So some genealogists say, well, we should say first cousin once removed down to indicate when you're talking about someone who's the generation down from you. Whereas if they're the generation up from you, they'd be your first cousin once removed up. Obviously, this is something that a lot of people aren't on board for because the remove system is kind of way too complicated enough for a lot of people. So it's kind of understandable, but it is something that is quite an interesting concept to think about because when you are talking about, oh, my first cousin once removed, you aren't really indicating, are they of the older generation or the younger generation? Let's continue. Now this will continue on just like this, adding one removal for each generation. But now let's talk about my grand aunts and uncles. Their children will be right down here. And we know it's going to be a cousin relationship because the most recent common ancestor we share, first cousin our once removed, require journeys through at least one generation. I have to go up through one, two to get there. They only have to go through one, which means that they are first cousins. The degree is always the smaller of the two journeys, but 
our journeys are of different lengths, which means we are removed in some way. I go through two generations, they go through one, so we are first cousins once removed. Now at this point you might say, whoa, 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 wait, this is a little bit strange because my cousin's children are my first cousins once removed, but my parents' cousins are also my first cousins once removed. <laughs> but don't worry, that's okay. In fact, it's quite helpful because if two people related to you in different ways have the same cousin name, same degree in removal, well then they approximately share the same amount of DNA with you. That is true. They, they're they going to share the same amount of DNA, same as aunts, uncles, and nibblings. They're going to share the same amount of average DNA. But when you look at the Shared Sense Morgan Project, you can kind of just look at the numbers and see, yeah, it's basically the same thing. The children of my first cousins once removed through this pathway are gonna be here. We know they're going to be cousins, but take a look at our paths up to our most recent common ancestor, what I call my great grandparents. I have to go through one, two generations to get there and they have to go through one, two generations to get there. We both go through two. Between two and two, the smaller is, well, still two, so they are my second cousins. And since we both go through the same number, the difference is zero, so there's no removal at all. These are just my second cousins, but their children will be removed. They'll still be second cousins because although they go through one, two, three generations to reach the most recent common ancestor, I only go through two, and we always use the smaller of the two, so they're second cousins. However, their journey goes through three generations, mine goes through two, three minus two is one. They are my second cousins once removed. Yep. Their children will be my second cousins twice removed, and so on. This pattern continues out with my third cousins existing here, my fourth cousins off this way, and so on. But the interesting thing to ask is how genetically similar am I to... No, I actually kind of think it's interesting that he didn't do a full fill out here because it kind of would show a bit more of the pattern if it showed, okay, well right here, this is a second cousin once removed. And then up here, this is a first cousin twice removed because it's your grandparents' first cousin, but they're two generations removed from you. So while this does give a large amount of the pattern, I feel like showing that gives just a bit more because it shows, yes, once you hit this third, then each generation down, third cousin once removed, third cousin twice removed. Whereas when you go up, starting there, it goes third cousin and second cousin once removed, first cousin twice removed, great grand aunt uncle, second great grandparents. And then when you go over fourth cousins, then third cousin once removed, second cousin twice removed. <laughs> so it's kind of the same thing, but just a little bit more complication to the pattern. So let's continue. Anyone else on this chart, and how can I use the chart to tell? Well, to do that, we need to know two facts. The first one is that children share half of their DNA with each parent, and they share about half of their DNA with a sibling. So knowing that, we can take a look at, for instance, how similar I am genetically to my aunts and uncles. So what he is actually estimating here is the shared sense of Morgan project, which instead of just kind of generalizing based on, well, you know, about 25% and about 50% and all of that, instead it's looking at the actual data. So literally thousands and thousands of submissions of how much DNA were uh, two people that have this known relationship sharing. So looking at all of these people that were first cousins that DNA tested, how much DNA were they all sharing? And then it actually creates this histogram and it shows all of the data and it's a very complicated thing uh it's by blaine bettinger and on the page which is for dna painter which is the best way to use it there is a link to like the full documentation of what's going on with it but that's basically what we use in genetic genealogy is the basic percentage of dna the amount that you're going to expect with a certain relative when you get a dna match you see how much dna you share and then that gives you an idea of how close or far away are they related? And then you start relating what tree information they have versus your tree and what DNA matches you both share. And then using a lot of that and a lot of research, that's then how you're able to figure things out of relations. So a great example is how adoptees find their biological families through DNA testing. 
or how law enforcement use investigative genetic genealogy to then figure out how, you know, the name or the identity of a Jane or John Doe or the identity of a violent perpetrator of a violent crime. So this stuff actually has some serious practical real world application. But to be sure, before we go any further, we should remember that every individual alive today has a genome that is more than 99% similar to every other person alive today. So when we and the DNA tests that you're taking, the consumer DNA tests that do these comparisons between you and other people, they're basically aiming for a lot of that DNA that has the variability that allows them to correlate it to certain population groups and be able to figure out which people are you related to. My aunt and uncle have some DNA. They share half of their DNA approximately with my parents. And I took half of my parents' DNA. So we've halved this genome twice. 50%, 25%. I share about 25% of my genetic makeup with my aunts and uncles. But their children took half away from them. So although I share 25% of my DNA with my aunts and uncles, I only share 12.5% about, really it ranges from like seven to 14 with my first cousin. Yes. The way you can tell is this, let's take two different people. Let's for instance, choose me and my first cousins once removed. We take a journey up to the most recent common ancestor and then go down, having the DNA shared every step of the way, except we skip the most recent common ancestor. So I share 100% of my DNA with myself. We go through one generation, so we're gonna half once. There's the most recent common. We half again as we go down to my aunts and uncles. So that's having twice. Then we half a third time and then a fourth time. So we've gone from 50%, 25%, 12.5%, somewhere around like 6%, then 3%, then about 1.5%, and so on. This is the same concept we use when looking at the admixtures, and we see, okay, we have 6.5% Greek reading that we weren't expecting. If that's coming from an ancestor who truly was 100% Greek, how far back is that going to be? Well, each generation you have it. So, 50% from your parents, 25% from your grandparents, 12.5% from your great grandparents, and then about six point whatever the DNA is from your uh, second great grandparents. And so then we can estimate, okay, well, if we're getting about, you know, 6.5 or whatever it is, then that's probably gonna be about how far back we need to go in our ancestry to find that ancestor who was 100% whatever it was. This is where you will see that first cousins once removed that are your cousin's children and first cousins once removed that are your parents' cousins have the same or roughly the same genetic similarity to you. To get from me to these people, I go, as we already did, 50%, 25%, 12.6. To go from me to here, we go 50%, 25%, 12%, 6%. CGP Grey also makes the funny observation that if we continue this pattern of third cousins, third cousins, second cousins, first cousins, our siblings could maybe argue zero with cousins. Our zero cousins. <laughs> I know. And I find that pretty good. I like that. But then, I love the horror music in the background of this. And somewhat in jest, perhaps, he says that that might make you your own negative first cousin. Mm. I think that's pretty clever. But I. But in reality, everybody is actually their own 20th cousin and 30th cousin and all sorts of stuff. Basically, everybody has what's known as pedigree collapse in their family tree. Basically, you have ancestors who were cousins who married other cousins. And in fact, I have a whole video explaining scientifically and mathematically why everybody is a cousin to everybody else. It's just a matter of how distant you are. But often that distance of how related you are to everybody usually varies on what population groups you're from. So like people from the same population group as you, you're probably gonna be related closer as a cousin, maybe 20th to 40th cousins. Whereas, you know, like someone who's from Europe versus someone who's from East Asia, well, they might be a bit further out, more like, you know, 40th or 50th cousins or something like that. So it is kind of interesting, but everybody has pedigree collapse in their, in their family trees. So you are your own cousin for sure. I will suggest that that doesn't make any sense because 
The degree of a cousin relationship tells us how many generations minimum must be passed through to reach a most common, a most recent common ancestor. In the case of your first cousin, you both pass through one, so it's a first cousin. In the case of your siblings, you both pass through zero to reach your parents, so zero cousins make sense. But you and yourself have a most recent common ancestor that's just your parents. So like your siblings, your zero cousins with yourself, you pass through zero generations to get to that most recent common ancestor. However, if we count traveling through a generation in the downwards direction, negative motion, then I guess technically if your own grandchildren gave birth to you, then you would be both your own zeroth cousin and negative first cousins with yourself. But if you remember just one thing from this video, keep this in mind. So basically, if you're, uh, if you're Fry from Futurama. If she's my grandmother, who's my grandfather? Isn't it obvious? You are. Then, yeah, you're your own negative first cousin. <laughs> if we drew this graph out large enough, we would find that all of us, every person, every stranger on the street, me, you watching right now, every dog, every alligator, every rock, every molecule of oxygen came from the same Big Bang. All right, very good video, but I was a little disappointed. There were a few things that he did not touch on. The first major thing it was the complicated sort of relationships that some people get really confused by, most notably double cousins and three quarter cousins. So I'm gonna try to pull up his chart and try to explain it. First, let's talk about double cousins. So right here we have first cousins, right? We are first cousins with them, but what is a double cousin? Well, a double cousin, or technically a double first cousin, because technically you could be more other types of double cousins, but a double first cousin, that would mean that your parents, your like, let's say, okay, this is your father, right? And then your father's sibling is, let's say, just to keep it easy, your father's brother is their father. Well, on the other side, your mother is the sister to their mother as well. So not only do you share the grandparent on this side, but you also share the grandparent on the other side because your parents, both your sets of parents are siblings. And when you look at the DNA there, they often end up looking more like a half sibling than a first cousin. And double cousins is actually something that's not too uncommon. It's not too surprising when you have multiple children from one family marrying multiple children from the other family, so then all of their siblings will be double first cousins to each other. But then I'm sure a lot of you are also wondering, well, what is a three quarters sibling? So we have half siblings, which is the other thing that I was kind of like, he didn't talk about half siblings. Why not talk about half siblings? Which I guess, actually, let me talk about half siblings before three quarters siblings. So a half sibling is when instead of having you sharing your both parents, a mom and a dad, you only share one parent with your sibling. So instead of sharing a mom and a dad, you only share a dad, but maybe you both have different moms or maybe you share a mom and you both have different dads. So that is a half sibling. So instead of having about 50% of your DNA that's shared, it's gonna be about 25%. And so in the same sense, you can then extend that. So you can have half first cousins. So instead of sharing a set of grandparents, you both only share one grandparent. So maybe you both share a grandfather, but then your parents descend from a different woman that he had the children with. And then it goes on and goes on. So you could have half second cousins, half fifth cousins, half great aunts and uncles and all of that, half aunts and uncles. But then a three quarters sibling is where you have it where, okay, you have your parents and then let's say your mom passes away. Well, then your father remarries your mother's sister and they have children. Well, you and that child of this second marriage are half siblings because you both have the same father. But then because your mother is a sister to their mother, you're also first cousins. And adding a half sibling and a first cousin then creates a three quarters cousin. So you end up sharing a bit more DNA than you would expect 
with a half sibling. So this is the kind of stuff where the families really get complicated. And then if you add in stuff like step parents and all of that, I know that adds an in-laws that adds a lot of complication to things, but I'm really happy that he spoke about DNA in his video because for purposes of genetic genealogy, obviously it's extremely important. And we have this thing, the shared Centimorgan project, as well as other things like there's the infamous green table that a lot of people use by a DNA detective. But basically they're just charts that show you a generalization of what you'd expect with certain relationship distances and how much DNA you're going to share. I think the Shared Santa Morgan Project is by far the gold standard. It is the best one to use because it uses real world data and has a huge data set. So once again, I thought that was a really fun video. He did mention CGP Gray's video a lot, which I wonder if maybe I should react to that one if you want me to comment below. I'm a little worried though, cause you know, the whole CGP Gray and vlogging through history thing that happened, but you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> but if you would like to check out other reactions I've done, be sure to check out this video right here. Thank you to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members.